All right, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. Um, my name is uh, Jason Cohen. I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, um, and I'm out here from, uh, from Maryland. And uh, the topic <coughs> of my talk today is uh, assorted security topics in uh, open cloud. And uh, it's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge, um, an overview of, uh, of the advanced threats, uh, some of the vulnerabilities from this past year or so. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the advancements in uh, OpenStack um, trusted computing uh, integration. And uh, if we have time, um, a little bit about the Hadoop encryption um, architecture. So real quick, a little bit about me. Um, so I'm happy to be here. And uh, if you don't believe me, I can offer an at-the-station proof to use a little trusted computing uh, jargon. <clears throat> this is what it looked like at my house before I left. <laughs> it was cold, snowing. Uh, kids were having fun, but uh, not me. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's warm here. There's snow to shovel. The water's not frozen. There's kangaroos, what have you. Um, like I said, I'm a technology consultant at Hewlett Packard. I've been there for about nine years. And uh, I work in mostly U.S. public sector uh, work, uh, a, a lot of uh, Department of Defense work. And um, a little disclaimer, I'm not, I'm not representing Hewlett Packard's interest in any way or endorsing products. That's all my own opinions and whatnot. But thanks for, uh, for them for sponsoring the event and uh, for, of course, uh, paying for me to be here. So thanks. You. And thanks to my wife and, and children for uh, letting me get away for this long. <clears throat> So here's a quick agenda, uh, and it's probably way too much, and I've already mentioned it, so I won't even read it again. <laughs> uh, but we're going to um, go for these topics here as uh, quickly as I can. And uh, so quick sampling of vulnerabilities from this past year. So this, this year wasn't, wasn't so bad. We didn't have a harp lead, but we did have a couple of, of big ones. Um, I could spend you know, the whole afternoon going over each one of the uh, various things impacting cloud over the past year, but uh, we certainly don't have time for that. So I'm just going to hit on a couple things that are relevant to, at least in my opinion, relevant to um, dealing with some of the uh, more advanced threats. <clears throat> but first, a little humor from today's headlines. I couldn't have planned this one better. Um, <laughs> as I saw this on the uh, Drudge Report, which if you're not familiar with, is a new service in, in uh, the US. And Microsoft app to count Iowa uh, election data for our uh, primary election uh, that's going on there, and uh, a lot of uh, outrage about that. And you wonder why? Probably something like this, right? So you, you, uh, the Microsoft has a, a lovely history of having a number of uh, high-profile vulnerabilities, and you know, typically tops the chart. Although this year, uh, I think uh, Apple was a close uh, or fairly close third behind. Um, our our uh, Linux. Um, uh, came in around 77, not counting all the various, uh, you know, subcomponents that are that are part of that. <clears throat> um, this was not from 15, but from uh, actually a little bit more recently. But uh, it was a bug in OpenSSH recently, um, and the client. It's a little bit of a contrived bug. I, I felt um, you had to have a um, exploit on the server side in order to actually exploit this. But it's kind of um, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting um, bug in that it's something that, uh, when I talk about APTs, that they might target uh, something kind of an oddball thing like this, where the, uh, you can get some private keys to leak um, from a client that's connecting to your server with this bug. And um, so the point is, you know, we're going to be mindful of the flaws and the, the various um, uh, tools that we depend on. And in particular with this one, um, the private key storage, which is going to be a, a kind of a, a theme here. Um, in, in this case, if the keys were uh, served from a, a hardware device or from a uh, actually just wrapped in a, an encryption uh, uh, password, uh, you wouldn't be able to extract them. <clears throat> okay, this one here, another headline. Um, recently, uh, it was a, a key ring exploitation. Uh, this one, again, is a kind of, I'll use an example of. Um, how an attacker would uh, gain uh, privilege ex uh, escalation uh, after they compromise a user account that has access to something in your network, um, and possibly use something like this to, to gain uh, root access. And um, uh, this has been uh, patched pretty recently. Um, and uh, they said in the, in the description, uh, Perception Point did a pretty good write-up on it, uh, published the attack, that the SE Linux, if you had that enabled, would make it a bit more difficult. 
And this was a fairly big one affecting cloud platforms. And we, of course, depend on virtualization as a foundation to, um, to security in the cloud. And when something like this comes along, you know, it, it, it kind of, um, for at least the outsiders, um, kind of uh, questions the, that assumption. And uh, this one was kind of interesting because it was a, I believe the Venom stood for uh, virtualization environment neglected operations manipulations. So they went after an old piece of code. And this is uh, something we're seeing a lot of lately. We're looking back at things like, you know, OpenSSL and things that have been uh, considered stable for a long time and trying to, to, to find, you know, old bugs that are in there that we can exploit. And in this case, it was a virtual floppy disk driver that uh, could be exploited and break out of the, uh, the virtualization container, which, of course, is, is not a good thing. And I saw this headline, and it kind of made me laugh a little bit. But in a way, it's, it's, it's got some point. Uh, protect the data, forget the perimeter. So I'll tell you a quick story. When I uh, kind of started my first real job in the field, I guess, back in 2002, I was working at Lockheed Martin. And we started an infrastructure outsourcing contract for um, Medicare and Medicaid services in the US. And basically, I took over this environment. It was a bunch of old NT4 servers, a bunch of old uh, mainframes that were older than me. And, um, you know, there was, I think the whole network's protected by a uh, Microsoft proxy server, NT4 proxy server, <laughs> maybe a firewall, conventional, a static firewall. And it was a mess. And, you know, we began a modernization effort. And, you know, everybody started focusing on security around that time as well. And, but yet, more and more we focus and we buy these appliances and these front end security products and lockdown ports and what have you. Um, it seems like it's, it's almost pointless. So the guy, that's the point this guy was making is that, uh, you know, let's start at a point where we're going to assume that our front end defenses are, are bypassed and let's look at how we're going to secure the data. And, and also, I'll add the, the keys if we're doing encryption, the keys to the kingdom, if you will, uh, that protect that data. <clears throat> But in the end, you know, we want it all around. Uh, you know, let's not forget the perimeter, but uh, you know, focused on on the, on the rounded uh, defense and depth solutions. So fundamentals of advanced persistent threats. <clears throat> um, so what makes an APT different from a conventional threat is that you know these are people that are going to uh, spend time, money, energy to um, to uh, exploit the network of their, their choosing. And the conventional security policies uh, that we depend on just um, just don't work, and um, they uh, they basically um, find a way in usually through a weak link of of a um, user or administrator, and uh, start moving away from from that. And uh, this was actually a brand new headline from today. It couldn't happen at a better time. A good example of a of an APT. Uh, I just read this briefly here a little while ago, and. Uh, this uh, hacking group um, broke into NASA. Uh, they were in there for about two years. Um, they got in by buying an initial foothold, whatever that means. And uh, once they did that, they were able to uh, break in the root through uh, exploiting an SSH uh, key. Uh, they uh, had a weak password. And they started moving around. And ultimately, they tried to crash a drone into the Pacific Ocean. And it was at that point that they finally got uh, picked up, um, detected at least and their access was, uh, was removed. Now, luckily, they weren't able to crash it there, by the way. <clears throat> so like I said, they're going to look at every possible entry point in a very patient manner. Um, they're going to target an organization through very convincing employees. Um, uh, spear phishing is, a, is a really a, um, kind of a number one way that they'll, they'll get in. A couple of examples, you know, the target payment card breach, um, our OPM breach, the RSA secure ID stuck to that. Um, and once they get in there, they're going to put covert channels in to exfiltrate your data without noticing by traditional sensors. <clears throat> and most of the literature source associates this with nation states, but as I just mentioned, you know, advanced hacking, hacktivist groups can also uh, be looking to do this. And um, here's a, one way that they might consider um, you know, doing a targeted attack. Uh, and I'm not saying that Tim is giving you uh, <laughs> infected USB tokens, but it uh, hasn't been unheard of for, uh, for an administrator to be at a conference and, uh, and targeted with, um, say, rootkit on a, you know, on a stick or something like that. And there's a seven-step exploitation lifecycle um, that's uh, typically done. And uh, it's pretty, pretty obvious if you think about it. It's reconnaissance. 
um, the initial intrusion, establishment of another back door uh, because they want to move on as quickly as possible, um, credential acquisition of an administrator, um, and then inst install their utilities, and then lateral movement and data, data exfiltration, and of course find as many ways as they can to maintain the persistence as they move through the network. <clears throat> and uh, there's a, you know, very difficult to detect persistence techniques like rootkits, firmware level attacks are even possible. And, um, and that's the kind of stuff that the trusted compute pools that we're going to talk about are, are, is designed to detect these kind of uh, low-level um, attacks. Not necessarily, you know, at a higher level runtime stuff, you're going to have to depend on, you know, security event management uh, to try to detect that um, in analytics of your logs. But um, to be able to detect a, a, a clean slate environment when a system comes up is, is kind of the point of, a, of the uh, trusted compute poles. <clears throat> so, like I said, defenses, active patch management, of course, is a must. Uh, the cloud, you know, gives us the technology to, to make this stuff a lot easier than it used to be. Um, and, uh, of course, um, security event information monitoring, like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's critical. To have a to not just collect logs but to, to analyze logs and we're lucky to have a lot of tools now uh, commercial and open source um, to, to be able to, to help in that <clears throat> uh, we can kill all the users or you know user training might be more practical I don't know um, although I think killing might be probably more practical because that it seemed like you can't train them but nevertheless um, and of course, you know, we've got to protect the data through, through encryption and make it the keys that are difficult to get. They don't have, you know, password one, two, three wrapping them or something like that. And then for physical security um, as well for insider threats, um, you know, you want to look at, um, you know, locking the door to your data center and of course locking your drives via um, encryption with like a self-encrypting drive or software encryption with keys rooted in a, a trusted platform module or something of that nature. And then, you know, if it's practical, try to, to consider all the runtime defenses. SC Linux sometimes could be, a, you know, difficult to deal with, but if you can use it, uh, write um, good policies for it, makes things harder. Uh, IMA EVM is just, um, out there, hasn't been updated in a while, but it's uh, another interesting possibility to uh, maintain um, known good configurations of all key um, trusted computing-based files. And of course, um, the measured, verified launch of your hypervisor to detect the rootkits is um, kind of what we're going to be able to do here with trusted compute poles and OpenStack. And I'll try to demystify somewhat uh, this. Um, if you read the, the glossies that Intel has, it sounds like, oh, this is real cool. I can, you know, but what does it really mean? So I'm, I'll try to, to do that real quick. So what do I mean by trust? So right from the dictionary, we're, you know, a reliance on the character, ability, strength, truth of something. So what does that mean when we're talking about booting up a, a machine and knowing if it's trusted? Uh, well, we can't do a formal measurement uh, of everything that's on the system. It's just not, not practical. We can't do a mathematical analysis. The system's too big. So the best thing we can do is when the system's booted, we can see if it's in a state that we, we think it should be in. And that's what this allows us to do. <clears throat> okay. So the, uh, the concept is you have a collection of, of, platform, of uh, platforms in your cloud that are considered trusted. And the reason that they're trusted is because they booted um, with, uh, with basically T-boot enabled, and um, they've talked to an attestation server. In this case, it's an it's a open attestation server, and it's um, attested to the, to the state of that platform at boot time. And it makes use of uh, the uh, TPM chip and uh, the OAT server uh, provides an API for, for other services like the Nova scheduler to check the status of a particular host, and you could use it and in, in integrate it into to any number of other applications. And like I said, it doesn't do anything to, to help against runtime attacks. Okay, so the fundamentals are uh, of this. So you, you have to have a TPM in the, in the chip, uh, I mean, in the server. Uh, this is pretty much a standard issue these days. Uh, there's you know, literally billions and billions of them have been installed in, in servers and computers over the years. Um, and they're going to have uh, these um, things I'm called PCRs, or platform control registers. And they're reset at boot. Um, and uh, basically, you're going to establish a, um, a chain of trust, starting at the firmware and uh, moving up to the point where you're measuring the launch environment. And uh, the PCRs are, gives you security 
and that they can only be extended. Um, you can't just stick whatever value you want in them. They, they take the previous measurement, combine it with the new measurement, do a SHA-1 hash, and uh, go up from there. And then besides that, um, and this isn't anything that's used in the, um, in the trusted compute pools necessarily, but uh, you can also use it to um, bind data, which is basically encrypt data, like other encryption keys. Um, to a particular platform state. So the PCRs need to be in a certain condition in order to release uh, a key, for instance, um, or to seal data, which is uh, encrypting against a key that's protected by the, a TPM key. It also provides a number of other things, uh, like a monotonic counters and NVRAM that allows you to store things. And it's definitely not a cryptographic accelerator. It's very slow. It's about 100 millisecond average response time. So it kind of limits it how you can use it in a time-sensitive application. Here's kind of a picture of, uh, of what, what it looks like on the inside. Um, the, uh, the key points here, I'd say, are in the persistent memory, you have an endorsement key and a storage root key. They're the only two keys that are really um, kind of permanent to the, to the TPM. The endorsement key is used as part of the, the attestation pro process to identify the TPM as a genuine TPM and not you know, some software uh, imitation and one that your uh, attestation server is going to trust. And a storage root key is used to encrypt any other key that you want the TPM to protect. And of course, you have the uh, PCRs that I already mentioned. And the attestation identity key, which is going to be used in the, and I'll explain a little bit more detail, that's used in the, in the attestation process when you're talking to the, uh, to the verifier. <clears throat> so here's the key hierarchy. I already kind of talked about that, so I'll move on. Uh, a picture of the key hierarchy. As I said, at, at the top level, um, you have the endorsement key and the storage root key. There's also an um, endorsement certificate, which is a signed um, version of the endorsement key that's been signed by the vendor. Um, in the case of Open Attestation Server, um, you actually create another endorsement certificate that's signed by the, um, by the public key of the attestation server that's used in, in lieu of this uh, built-in one. So at the software layer um, on your uh, node, uh, you're going to need to have a couple of tools installed. Uh, obviously, a TPM driver. Trousers is the standard C library for Linux um, that, uh, that basically any higher level applications use to communicate to the driver. Um, and the TPM tools are the basic user land uh, tools that you need in order to work with the TPM manually. <clears throat> and then in order to, to make the trust computing pools work, you need uh, tboot. Uh, these other things here are optional for, for uh, using the TPM for other things. I've used JTSS, which is a, a Java interface um, to the TPM to integrate some, some operations into uh, using Java, with, you know, if you're interested in that. And then, <clears throat> like I said earlier, I, IMA EVM has an option to use a TPM uh, to um, validate the, uh, the, the hashes that you maintain locally of known good files. So it might be something of interest, but not related to the trusted compute pools. And what it's not, it's not an HSM, but what do you expect for a dollar? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's not an accelerator. It's better, more like a decelerator. And it's not tamper-proof, but it's very, very tamper-resistant for, for what it is. Uh, these are some, uh, some benchmarks. I don't know if you can re read it. Probably not. Uh, that I did myself on it to, to show you kind of how slow it is. Um, when you create a binding key, for instance, like in here, the average was 18 seconds. Oops, sorry. Uh, and uh, loading the key took uh, that a little over almost two seconds. Um, but then when you're actually um, binding with it, uh, in, I'm, excuse me, uh, extending the PCRs is, is, is pretty quick. So it doesn't really slow down the, the boot process or anything like that. And the attestation process is happening in, in the background anyway. So the uh, little bit of, of lag it adds there is, is negligible. <clears throat> and now I will mention that there's a new spec, TPM 2.0, that is, um, is, act, is out. A lot of machines are, actually have a TPM 2.0 that are being shipped now, but they're, they come shipped in 1.2 configuration. Um, there's some interesting changes to it, namely in, in uh, terms of um, it adds some new encryption algorithms. Uh, it um, replaces SHA-1 with SHA-256 and also adds support for ECC and also for um, uh, basically a vendor to add their own encryption algorithms. This was added more for like China to be able to add their own algorithms to it. Um, and uh, it also adds a, um, in TPM 1.2, you only have a um, one basically owner of the TPM. And that, that owner has to essentially uh, have an authorization 
uh, key pass key, if, if you will, that uh, that unlocks all the other operations of the TPM, and it's kind of cumbersome. Um, they add uh, several three layers of um, of uh, different um, uh, users, I guess, if you will, um, to to the TPM 2.0. So here's what I mean by static chain of trust. Um, you can see your BIOS ROM is assumed to be, I'll say assumed in quotes, to be um, basically trusted. And that starts off the process of adding uh, the values to the PCR. Now the first uh, a couple are basically all BIOS related. Then you move on to flash. And what this is pointing out is that th th this is where static root of trust breaks down because if you have option ROMs like network cards, hard drives, these kind of things, you it might not be practical to measure them all. And, um, and so the T-Boot solution, it, well, what Intel TXT does is it kind of chops that part of it out and it focuses on the bootloader and the uh, OS kernel. <clears throat> so the TXT technology is used in, in T-Boot, like I said. I hear some of the jargon that, that you'll hear when you look up um, uh, you know, configuring uh, trust compute poles. It, it sounds really complicated, and it kind of is. <laughs> it's overly complicated. But in, in, in short, um, they added a processor instruction. This is quite a few years ago at this point that uh, basically puts the processor in a special clean slate where it blocks execution of pretty much everything else that's going on and allows for um, a particular piece of code to execute that's been signed uh, by Intel. It's called an authenticated code module. and um, and then uh, basically that does some verification of, um, of your bootloader, which in this case is T-Boot, and it allows T-Boot to, uh, to go ahead and, uh, and extend these PCRs, these dynamic PCRs, uh, with the hash values of your, um, of your, uh, your basically your operating system or VMM, uh, the kernel. And uh, the launch control policy <clears throat> is something that you can embed in the TPM and VRAM and essentially, it's a list of what to validate and what to do, depending on the failure. Um, I will note that you actually don't have to make a launch control policy for this to work. Um, if you just want it to measure, it will measure a default list of things that are typically good enough. <clears throat> uh, so these are the things that it, that it measures by default. Um, basically, the BIOS image, kernel images, all modules loaded at boot time, and all grub boot options, and these are where it puts it. <clears throat> So the attestation is kind of the, the key of this, this whole, whole thing. And so that's, so once we have our system configured um, how we want it, our, our uh, let's say our compute node, um, we need it to basically um, take a copy of the PCR values as it's booted with T-boot and put them on this attestation server. And then we have a client that uh, runs uh, on demand that validates that those PCRs are in the state that that it um, should be in. So the TCG, which is the Trusted Computing Group that's defined all this technology, <clears throat> they, uh, they had this grand plan that, you know, back in the day when they, this, this stuff came out that, uh, you know, if you had a, your laptop and you wanted to talk to, to the bank to do a transaction that you'd first have to attest and uh, your computer was in a good state before they let you in. And it created this whole controversy over the privacy and how, you know, a user might lose their privacy on the internet and it could be used for, um, you know, things like, um, like control of um, uh, DRM. And, uh, but they introduced this thing called Privacy CA to try to get around that. And it lets the Privacy CA be the trusted source of attestation. And none of this ever panned out in the real world. But when we're talking about this infrastructure service, um, uh, Intel said, well, we can write a Privacy CA and use it as part of infrastructure. And who cares about the privacy aspect of it because it's not relevant? So anyway, the uh, TPM, uh, it has this endorsement key, and the privacy CA needs to know the pro public part of that, uh, for starters. And, uh, as, and when you're installing Open Attestation Server, um, the install script generates its own um, endorsement certificate. And uh, basically, this is uh, stored to the TPM and VRAM. And then when it, it also generates a uh, attestation identity key. Now, that seem, might seem redundant, but that, it goes back to why the open, I mean, excuse me, the uh, privacy CA existed because the second level key, although it, it's wrapped by the endorsement key, is not traceable to a particular TPM. So all that's still there, even though it's not really, uh, really relevant in, in, the, in this application per se. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, so the uh, at the station server um, uh, basically is going to um, to generate this uh, this AIK, the at the station identity key, for each TPM that, that it's going to validate as part of the trusted compute pool, and um, that's going to be uh, you know stored locally on the client. And when it's time to do an at the station, the client is going to read the values of the PCRs that are relevant to the at the station process. It's going to sign it with the um, at the station key and also add a nuance to it that is um, that is given from the appraiser from the open at the station server. And the point of that is to prevent a relay attack. So it sends that all back and that's something that can't be forged because that um, at the station identity key is, um, is can only be in that particular TPM. <clears throat> so here's kind of a picture of how, how it works. Probably makes more sense than how I explained it. Um, so on the host side, you're uh, actually going to request the appraisal. Um, the way this works is, seems kind of backwards, but the, uh, the appraiser then uh, selects the nuance, um, sends it back. The t uh, on the host side, it loads that key. It does the quote operation like I described and sends it back. And uh, then that's going to be verified against a, a database of, that, uh, of the whitelist of the known PCR values. And uh, then when, a, um, when something comes in and like a... Like a, like a Nova job and ask, hey, is this host trusted? It's going to return an answer. It's either it's binary. It's either it's trusted or it's not trusted. <clears throat> so putting it all together, um, so like I said, you have each of the of the, uh, of the uh, compute nodes that are enabled with the T boot, uh, with the uh, TPMs enabled, TXT enabled, the client installed. Um, you have this open attestation server. You put part of your infrastructure. And um, you basically interfaces with the Unova scheduler, um, and uh, that's kind of the long short. Now I've got to show you this, so it makes it'll make sense in a minute. <clears throat> and uh, the install process, I will say a couple words about. I spent a lot of time fiddling with this. Um, it's uh, it's a little tricky. Don't bother to find some guides out there to describe how to use it on particular versions of RHEL or Ubuntu, and they're they're dated like 6.5 and older version of Ubuntu. I forget which one. Uh, you know, unless you're going to run that exact environment, they don't bother with the pre-built RPMs. Go ahead and build the latest 2.3 version of it. Um, and you need to be very, very cognizant of your... Somebody said earlier that they hate Java. I now know what they mean by that. Uh, you have to be very cognizant of the version of Java you have on your server and your clients. It'll have to be 1.7. I had an uh, issue where some process, I, I knew that it needed to be 1.7, but some process in the background installed 1.8 on me, and I had one you know, client that was built with that, and it would not, for the life of me, work. Um, and I finally realized that's what was going on, so make sure you, you, you do that. And of course, some other common things that you need to do beforehand, you gotta make sure all your hosts are configured um, properly for DNS or uh, host files. And there's some instructions that you need to follow on how to configure a firewall, um, and, uh, and uh, well, not, but um, and be aware too that the the logs that the, the that are created on the host actually contain the TPM owner secret. <clears throat> okay, one other quick note uh, that that I found out um, is you need to configure Java to, to accept SSL version three connections on the OAT server. Uh, I don't know why, but for some reason the tool, all the tools associated with this, uh, explicitly ask to connect over SSL version three, and that's been turned off in newer versions. <clears throat> and I found that you also need to run this uh, command to um, generate a new EK after you install the client as well. If you see an error like this, uh, you probably have a Java version mis mismatch. And quick note about this, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the the um, software, most is written in Java, but the part that talks at a TPM is a library actually, I think written by the NSA, that um, is a C library, and it passes things to it, and um, the Java part passes to the, this, this external library, and the library expects the owner authorization to be in hex, and for some reason, if on Java 1.8, the owner authorization gets sent in ASCII, I don't know what they changed, but for some reason that, that was the case. After a lot of head banging, I figured that, that out, why it was messing me up. <clears throat> um, so after you get all that set up, you also have to um, download this ACM module from Intel. You have to rebuild um, your um, uh, Grub2 uh, config. And if you want it to boot by default, trust it boot, uh, you need to configure the menu for that. And then you need to access your whitelist portal. 
and you add the details of your uh, measured launch environment, which is the PCR values. <coughs> Now, this came with a uh, script to integrate into OpenStack Juno, which, as we know, is a little bit dated. Uh, I tried to get it to work with uh, Liberty. Um, it's probably possible. It just uh, was too much um, kind of fiddling with the install scripts that I was willing to do. So uh, I did get it to work on Juno. The, the Juno is, um, version that it, uh, it came with is also um, install scripts that it came with is, is, is meant for Ubuntu. So if you want to use it on uh, RDO like I did, uh, you have to do some simple mods to the install scripts. <clears throat> and uh, Open App Station 2.3 also adds another interesting feature that they call trusted location control. And the idea here is if you want a server that's running uh, and that you want to, to excuse me, to um, uh, deploy a compute job to a server that's in a specific geographic area and you want some sort of insurance that it's there, uh, you can burn an asset tag into the TPM and VRAM, which is just going to be a Shaw value that represents that location. So, and then the idea is unless somebody picked it up and moved the server physically to another country or location, that you can kind of trust that it's in that, in that um, location because that tag can't be spoofed. <clears throat> the OAT architecture looks something like this. Um, it's uh, meant as a reference architecture. It's not meant to be out on your network because uh, it's uh, very poorly uh, secure <laughs> security designed. It doesn't have any sort of user passwords or anything. So keep that in mind. It's meant as a reference. Uh, you need to write some stuff around it. Um, but essentially, it's got this, uh, this eight, these two APIs that work with your application interfaces with these, uh, these tables that it maintains of your host and the whitelist values. And the uh, the, the client uh, sends uh, request response looks looks something like this, and like I said, it's basically you're asking if a particular compute node is um, is trusted, and that it booted up in the configuration that you expected, um, and uh, it returns a result which is um, either trusted or not trusted. And you can also find some generic instructions on how to install it. You, um, these are from uh, 2.2, so you need to kind of modify some of the details a little bit to make it work with newer version. Um, but uh, essentially, um, it uh, involves editing the uh, Nova comp file and adding this um, SSL certificate from your OAT server, and um, then configuring flavors that will run only on trusted or not, you know, not trusted. <clears throat> so it sounds good. So why isn't everybody using this, right? <laughs> so there's no easy button. That's what I want. One easy button, damn it. It's not there. Sorry. Uh, the code's dated. Um, it hasn't been updated in a major way. It's a reference implementation. Things are broken here and there. Um, it's a little bit hard to figure out. The standards themselves are kind of, you know, they're kind of a little bit um, overwhelming if you haven't seen them before. And of course, there's still the lingering privacy fears. <clears throat> but I think if we can get over all of this, it kind of it's an it's an interesting way to. Um, to, to kind of combat some of these persistent threats that are specifically targeting um, VMMs or kernel uh, rootkits and, and even uh, possibly uh, firmware level attacks. So, okay, I'm going to try to do a demo. We'll see if it works. <clears throat> okay, now, what the heck happened? Okay, so first thing, this is the, uh, the Open Attestation Server's portal to access the whitelist that I mentioned. And um, basically, what you do is you add your OEM um, and you add, let's see, I'll show you. You add an o the OS version, and then you add an MLE. Now, the MLE defines um, the, uh, the, well, you basically the manifest list that you can see here, hopefully, uh, of the, the values that you want to include uh, to be uh, verified against. And then there's also another, um, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. 
anyway, there's, a, there's also a place where you input the, the BIOS um, details, the versions, and then those static um, PCRs that I mentioned that the BIOS itself extends, you can also be included as part of this here. <clears throat> so once you got that done and you've configured your host, you will have a, you, this uh, dashboard, which you can see none of this has any passwords on it by default. Okay, so these are my two uh, nodes I have here in my uh, trusted pool. And basically you can see here that the trust status is all good. Um, and the asset tag uh, I haven't put in, so that's showing that it's no asset tag there. Um, and uh, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, um, oh, one other thing I'll show you too before I do this. So this is the integration into the Horizon dashboard. Sorry, <laughs> it's in a VM. All right, there it is. Okay, so you can see what it's added here is a another field geotag and um, what's basically that asset tag I ref referred to as the geographic location, and then the lock symbol, which is basically, like I said, the binary answer if the node is trusted or not. So right now, like we saw over in that other portal, uh, these are both uh, showing up as trusted. The other thing that's, at, that's been added, if you go into images, you can um, go ahead and select if you want this particular image to run on a uh, trusted location or um, on a trusted node. Okay, so let's so let's go ahead and hack the system over here real quick. All right, hopefully this won't give you some sort of, all right. So I don't know if you can see it. So that's the PCRs of the uh, system as it is. Uh, you notice 18 through, excuse me, 17 through 19, there are the values that are set by T-Boot, and the earlier ones up there are set by the BIOS. So let's go ahead and uh, reboot. Dirty screen. <laughs> okay, now my hack is going to be pretty simple. I'm going to restart this with uh, without using T boot, uh, but let's just imagine that a hacker has uh, compromised this uh, this um, kernel and uh, booted it up. So that's all I need that for. Give it a second. Okay, so you can see here now that that's, this node was node trusted one. It's now got the 
unlock there, which means it is not trusted anymore since we weren't able to verify it. And then if we uh, flip back over here to the webcam, uh, we'll see that those PCRs now are all full of Fs, which mean they haven't been set by a trusted boot. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I don't know if I have any time left. Five minutes? All right. So a quick word about Zen. You can also use uh, Zen with this, and uh, Zen gives you the option of using a virtual TPM. I don't know if I would trust it necessarily, but it gives you the option to use a, a TPM within your uh, host, I mean, some of your guest virtual machines as well um, through a brokered access to the TPM. <clears throat> Um, there are some other ways you can possibly use TPMs to benefit cloud security besides what I just showed you. Um, Matthew Garrett somewhat expired, inspired this talk. Uh, I believe he's speaking on Friday. Uh, he mentioned um, using uh, the TPM to also um, provide a source of randomness as a cloud service and also possibly use the CHAPS package um, as, a, as a wrapper for using uh, TPM keys a lot easier than it currently is. There's bare metal options. Um, you can also look in Trusted Grub for bare metal servers. Uh, if you don't care for the T-boot uh, version. Um, and Trusted Grub is a st purely uh, stat um, static uh, root of trust, uh, which could be work well with IMA EVM um, in a bare metal situation. There's also been talk in phase four of uh, Key Manager to use the TPM to store keys. I don't know. Maybe somebody here knows the status of that. I haven't uh, seen any indication of that yet. Um, maybe you can use it to defend your Death Star against droid attacks. I don't know. <clears throat> there are some TPM attacks uh, out there. I happened to be at this talk at DEF CON where a guy did an analysis of uh, STTPM, which are crap. Uh, that the Infineon ones are much better, but um, you know, don't don't uh, think it'd be outside the uh, realm of a nation state to be able to to, to do a destructive attack on your TPM. Uh, you would know that it happened because they'd have to take it and destroy it in the process. Uh, it's much more likely that you would do a software level attack. Like I said, they off they, you know, getting a hold of the, uh, the authorization um, password, for instance. Um, you could um, you know, reset the TPM and then cause a denial of service in your cloud. Uh, you could possibly hack the, the open out the station server and just have it always return trusted or always return untrusted if you wanted. And that would uh, cause, obviously, a denial of service or other issue. Uh, and a quick note of firmware uh, of interest, uh, you know, like I said, the firmware is always um, uh, is considered the, the first step in the trusted um, path, and um, uh, vendors have kind of moved to try to cover these concerns about firmware level attacks via mutable boot blocks and trying to go for 147.b compliance in this standard, make sure that your, you know, servers are compliant in that way. And other vendors are taking things to a different level. Um, HP has something called Sure Start that has a separate embedded controller that does a um, out-of-band analysis of your um, firmware each time the system starts and uh, sees if it's uh, been changed in any way. And there's also um, Intel boot card. <clears throat> and then even, you know, like I said, option ROMs are something, you know, like uh, uh, if you recall the equation group uh, that uh, came out uh, last year where they uh, detected some uh, hard disk uh, firmware altercations. So I don't know if you have, do I have any time? <laughs> no, okay. Well, I guess I don't have time to talk about Hadoop encryption, but I'll say real quick that they've added it as of 2.3. Um, it's uh, it's it's uh, pretty cool if you have an environment that um, have compliance issues and you've been traditionally maybe paying for a uh, encryption solution. You can take a look into into this. It's um, it's very transparent to the client and to the existing software you might have. Uh, it adds uh, very little overhead uh, because of AES-NI enabled and uh, their Intel-based processors. And um, it uh, works with a, uh, a key management server that uh, essentially has these different layers of keys. And I'd be happy to, if anybody had questions about it, uh, to talk about it uh, offline. So, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be opportunity to talk in the hallway and around the conference, no doubt. Please join me in thanking Jason. Thank you. Thank you.